Hola, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to our Flourish Focus. This is a series where we feature exchanges with entrepreneurs from around the world. My name is Diana Narvaez. I am a principal at Flourish Ventures and I am responsible for investments in Latin America. Um, we are an early stage global venture capital fund and we partner with entrepreneurs for building world-class companies um, that are disrupting legacy infrastructure and that are helping customers really achieve financial health. Um, I am super excited and at Flourish, we are excited about the potential of SaaS companies, software as a service companies to solve real life um, and real business problems and to also leverage their platform to embed financial services. Um, we believe that this allows those companies to provide more tailored and more digitally operating support to their clients as they create better, more affordable banking access for historically underserved SMBs in LATAM. Um, we have seen in Latin America substantial transformations in this sector. So over the past five to six years, there has been an increase in the number of publicly listed SaaS companies in the region from about three to 11. And also we have seen a significant increase in venture funding. So just to have a benchmark, about six years ago, two out of three SaaS companies in the region were bootstrapped. And today we see more and more that this ratio has decreased and that more and more funds, venture capital funds like Flourish, are looking to invest in these type of companies. So I am very proud to be here today with two of the leading funders and innovators in the space, Gonzalo Parejo and Santiago Morales, to talk about their learnings uh, as they build and they scale a SaaS company or their SaaS companies in LATAM. Um, hola, Gonzalo, Santiago, thank you so much uh, for being here today. Hola, Diana. Thank you, Flourish team. Thank you so, so much, Diana and Kirsten. Of course. Before we start, um, I'd like to just do a brief introduction. Gonzalo, um, Gonzalo is a co-founder and the CEO at Camino. Camino is a financial management software with embedded B2B payments, and it's designed for a small, I'm sorry, for medium-sized uh, service companies in Brazil. Uh, and Santiago is a co-founder and CEO at Morada Uno. Uh, Morada Uno is a Mexican platform that empowers real estate brokers with software and technology that makes the process of renting a property easier, faster, and safer. So without further ado, let's kick it off. And I'd love to start talking about your respective journeys at Camino and Morada Uno. So Gonzalo, maybe let's start with you. Uh, we all know that starting a SaaS business in LATAM comes with a lot of unique challenges. Um, and this is not your first rodeo. You're a serial founder. Uh, and so super curious to know what inspired you to start Camino and if you could share some of the initial hurdles that you faced. Um, thank you. So Camino, the inspiration for Camino maybe started uh, 12 to 13 years ago. Uh, Camino is a software company, yes, that was launched by four uh, co-founders. Three of us are serial entrepreneurs here in Brazil. We started it off uh, launching Grupo on Brazil here with one of my co-founders, Benjamin. Then we all moved after the IPO to launch our own uh, endeavors. And one of the main pain points that we suffered back in 2012, 2013, when nobody was even aware of what fintech was, is that the startups that we were launching had serious trouble trying to find proper or adequate payment solutions. So we were raising large amounts of money and we needed to spend that in software solutions, either pay things through corporate card and it was basically impossible. I had to use my personal corporate card and then manage to get reimbursed every one or two months and don't raise any suspicions from my US funds. Now that we're thinking this Spanish guy living in Brazil, moving large pieces of money from one uh, uh, company bank account to his personal bank account, you know, and it was their first investment in Brazil. No, imagine trying to uh, uh, to explain them what was going on. And secondly, 
during the board uh, meetings, they were always feedback about how inaccurate the information was, how long mm -hmm. it took us to build very basic reporting, uh, the fact that data was changing from one month to the other, not rewriting the past. So we were using a lot of Excel sheets. So there was a lot of garbage in, garbage out. So those two pain points started basically 12 to 13 months ago, uh, 13 years ago. Lately, prior to launching uh, Camina, I co-founded a private equity firm. We bought basically around 15 to 20 companies in less than two years. We bought highly profitable mid-sized companies. And I noticed that those companies were not startups, obviously, and they were suffering from similar pain points. Poor payment solutions, no financial, financial management solution, no visibility on the cash flow, et cetera, et cetera. So we basically noticed that there was no way that there was something that uh, that was being done actually for not either uh, not only for startups but also for mid-sized companies. Amazing, um, lots of experience and suffering this pain point yourself. Um, obviously, leads to better founders that are solving real problems for businesses. Um, Santi, we'd love to hear about Mura Uno. Um, that moment when you decided that you wanted to launch this, this company, what drove you to, to tackle that particular problem that you will tell us in a minute? Yeah, for us, I think um, it, it's a known fact that real estate is huge, right? It's, it's a huge market. I continue to grow. It's fed to demographics. So um, the trend is, is always like, continuing to, to expand. However, we felt the market was not cracked. Like there's a, a ton of dynamic, um, mixed dynamic is very fragmented. It's hard to tackle. You have the landlords and tenants and real estate agents. And, and like this, this kind of like complex um, dynamic between them. And, and it's very expensive to, to acquire them and, and really, really expand and make it scalable. So we said, let's, let's start solving the most acute problem which is um, in, in rentals, in Latin, uh, rentals is very hard. I think it's very hard. Tenants require a guarantor or a co-signer that owns property in the same city in order to rent. Um, it, it's incredible. Like people from outside won't believe that. Um, so what we say is like, can we solve that with technology? Can we go and say, uh, on the rented right tenant, then um, guarantee rent for, for the landlord. And by doing this, we, we started getting instructed into transactions. And that's kind of like, how we, how we started solving a very, very acute problem uh, for, for a huge demographic. 40% um, of tenants do not have access to traditional renting requirements. So we, we said, okay, let's solve this. And then we found ourselves on at the center of transactions between um, this, this trio of, of tenants, landlords, and the, the real estate agent. Um, and that's how kind of we, we now have a platform that uh, is powered by technology and allows real estate agents to um, embed different financial products. We'll we'll talk a, a bit you know in a second. But at the core, we said we can't believe this continues to, to go on. And um, it, it was just like so apparent and so latent. We decided to go after that. Yes, I myself lived in Mexico City, and I remember trying to find a rental apartment. The obstacles and the friction to uh, sign a contract was humongous. I had to, at that point, had the company that had hired me to go to Mexico actually be my guarantor for my rental um, property. So this is definitely uh, an important product to, to allow more renters to access or tenants to access um, rental properties in an easier and way. And we'd love to further touch more about the, the platform, the actual platform, and how it helps the real estate brokers who, at the end of the day, are the ones that complete this transaction, uh, right? Because the end, the end client is the tenant and the renter, but the SaaS solution is actually for, um, for key players in your distribution channels. Um, and you mentioned, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, that's that's a great point. One of the things we we figured out is like okay, there's this huge problem for forty percent, thirty, forty, fifty percent of of tenants right, that they can't rent. They require this this rent to be. But what about the rest, right? What about somebody who has very good credit score, very good um, credentials? Uh, and we think we like we needed a, a form that would manage everything from a AAA tenant to 
a somebody without access to a grant or to like all mix and match uh, types of tenants. So we at we devised this platform where, where like brokers, real uh, real estate agents will be able to like upload a tenant um, if, if they want, let's say a lease agreement or the full protection or only a background check. Like whatever they need, they can they can pick and, and match and and embed different financial products from insurance, uh, property insurance to uh, having the rent guaranteed, or maybe they just want like a couple of background checks. So by doing this, we we really understood or say okay, like what do like uh, our customer really needs. Not only rents are are the same. Some rents require X or some require a different type of protection or what so. Um, so this allowed us to like really. Um, I guess uh, drive stickiness with brokers because they said, okay, like now I can have like my full portfolio, my full um, yeah suite of rentals with Morada Uno, uh, regardless of uh, if, if it's only like document collection or document management, and they can like manage their their uh, their business value that's great. Or if they can like uh, add different different products, that's also great. So kind of like that's been at the at the core, uh, trying to solve a, a real problem for them, and then that actually driving uh, retention. And that's that's great. As you talk about and focus on this particular segment, um, I think that's a perfect segue into talking about client acquisition and retention. Um, I There was a recent survey um, that was done to SaaS companies in Latin America um, by our friends at SaaS Holic, and they found that Companies in the top SaaS companies in the top decile, um, their CAC, they're able to control their CAC better, um, keep it under control, even as they grow their ARR. So I'm super curious here, maybe we can go back to Gonzalo again. You guys at Camino have been extremely systematic at arriving at your ICP, your ideal customer profile. Um, and you learn in, throughout this journey that not all clients are the same, not all SMBs, not all mid-sized companies in Brazil are the same, and therefore they should be treated differently. Um, love to hear your learnings in this journey. And what would you say were those early signs that you discovered your ICP? So, so the thing is, at the end, the problem was very large. We wanted to help SMBs in Latin America starting out of Brazil uh, to grow faster uh, with more visibility on how they were spending and with more efficiency. And we were, uh, let's say, inspiring ourselves in solutions like uh, Build.com or Ramp or Brex, uh, Raw even, no? So the idea was to build a software with a B2B payments embedded that were actually being able to handle accounts payables, account receivable, reconciliation, et cetera. And at the end, when you think, okay, this is going to be a solution that's going to work for SMBs in Brazil, the reality is that it, the concept of SMBs in Brazil is very large. We have 21 million companies in Brazil, maybe 1.5 million fit in that concept of true company that is not an enterprise. Basically, let's forget about enterprise. They have their own means to solve things, large, uh, large budget, uh, budget to solve that. So when we were facing a, mar a market of 1.4 million companies with a lot of uh, needs, no, and very little culture in Brazil about buying software, uh, what we decided is okay. Let's negotiate what it, what they are actually non-negotiable, uh, not non-negotiable things. Like we have to be a software company. Uh, the main uh, point of entrance need to be a software company, something that is going to be a pain point that we're going to solve with software. Software needs to be the main source of revenue. So the ICP needs to feed on that uh, key, key issue. We had to prove also that we had product market fit, channel market fit, and willingness to pay. So that was sort of like the filter, the kaleidoscope we used to make sure that the ICP was the type of ICP that we wanted. And that ICP, to be able to pay software, you actually need to have a strong pain point that is forcing you, no? or you, are, you can inspire that pencil to pay monthly uh, for that instead of hiring somebody, okay? Secondly, uh, uh, you need to have enough of those clients in the market, okay? Because you say, no, they are going to pay. I found the ICP, but there's just 10 of those guys in the market, okay? So no, it needs to be a very large market. For us, that was no brainer. And uh, this third thing is 
those clients need to pay a fair price. And a fair price for software in a region that is very hard to settle a price because there are very little companies that have done this before. It was also uh, highly, uh, highly complicated. So when you say how we did that, it was basically making sure that on a regularly basis, we were filtering our findings on, the, on that main criteria. How far can we go with the price? Do we control the channel? Is there actually a large market for that type of ICP? Exactly my point. Okay. Super systematic way of, of thinking about that. I was going to say that. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, the reality is that... Oh, no. uh, Imagine the discussion you had, you know, also uh, uh, a few my co-founders, Santiago, and uh, you can imagine the discussions every Monday morning about how how we could actually make our software more focused on a single pain point. How can we ask for a, a stronger, let's say, higher price, even though that was impacting, let's say, our our conversion. No, but I think in the early beginnings is when you can actually make those trade-offs. Mm -hmm. Gonna add that like you sound you sound very polished around like perfect ICT and clarity and uh, that's great on our end. Um, we thought that okay, like if we acquire uh, real estate agents, that's that's for ICT, right? Like they have a huge pain point there. Um, and then it took us a, quite a bit of time to really understand. Um, I guess like we started seeing a, a huge difference between uh, the, the platform usage. Um, some would be using it uh, monthly and maybe like um, I guess over 10 times a year, like having multiple financial transactions. Then, then there was another uh, ICP or non-ICP um, that was using us like seven times less. Um, and that's when we said, okay, like what, we're treating everybody. What you're using, what you're saying is that there were a large variety of ICPs using your, uh, uh, it, that that is true, it's absolutely true. It's what the same thing that happened to us, but is you just start filtering that and you say, well, what is actually, you know, the, you, wh where are yeah. you doing actually that exercise of thing? That's the type of guy I want using my my platform or not? Exactly, and, and even today we continue to do uh, refinements of of the ICP, and we said, okay, we started very broadly with like um, SMEs within brokerage houses and like big brokerage houses and independent um, agents. But then we like now we just double clicked again and said, okay, like there's a difference between like a tech adopter within um, a, a SMB and an independent that uses a local face for X space right? So I think for us, it's a, it's a key thing that to continue to drive uh, the ICP and, and you have very, a lot of clarity around, they need to use software. Um, for us, it's about usage. Like if they, if they have you know, stickiness and they continue stickiness. to come back, um, that's you know, like the, the best way to say, okay, we're really solving something for them. Um, and we saw this that, oh yeah, I love the product, but I don't use it that much. And we started kind of like carving out um, that, but it's it's been a challenge for us for sure. But but it, at, at the end, I think it's sort of the same experience, uh, some maybe with some different uh, connotations of, of wording, but at the end we spend maybe eight to 12 months basically looking at different ICPs, making sure we were defining them, looking at the cohorts, looking at how each cohort or how we, each ICP was growing in terms of NRR, in terms of also the, the top of the funnel, no? um, and uh, uh, looking at uh, the average contract value. Um, if we're actually say this is the type of, if you actually want to build a multi-billion dollar software company, um, you actually need to be quite demanding in terms of the average contract value that you want to bring to the table. And also if you want to have impact, you need to make sure that you're bringing on board companies that are going to be yeah. survive exactly grow. No, maybe they're little now, no? but you see that they are uh, they have curiosity about organizing their finances on a more, let's say, professional way. Such an interesting conversation. I think there is a lot of great insights for all the founders that are that are listening and that are thinking about starting a, a SaaS company or in the process of. Um, so. Yes, you, and you talked about um, we talked about engagement, uh, Santiago. You just mentioned about stickiness as well, and and uh, Gonzalo, you talked about pricing and monetization, right? So we've observed that 
companies that go through a product sequency journey from developing a hook product for customer acquisition, and then they expand into a product offering to build deeper engagement and stickiness. Um, and then it all needs to support monetization of the business. So maybe Santi, you can you can share with us here. Um, I think Mora, you know, you correct me if I'm wrong here, but you have been very successful on this front of using your platform to secure high engagement from real estate brokers by helping them with their day-to-day -day functions, helping them increase their top line, helping them close more transactions faster. Um, however, if I understand correctly, you're not monetizing or you're not charging them a subscription fee. Um, again, correct me if I'm wrong here, but rather the main monetization or revenue source is through embedded financial products. Um, so tell us more about this monetization strategy, how you yeah. guys thought about product sequencing, learnings, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and I think this is one of the things that might um, diagram for from products of labels where you acquire through, through SaaS. Um, we were, we figured out, it was a matter of selling what's easier to sell productivity in that sense for, for the broker, you can manage the rentals, et cetera, or actually uh, um, sell revenue, right? Because we were providing access to rentals they could not close. Um, so we said, okay, we, we start with the financial product and that's how we started. We started with the, the rent guarantee. Um, but we, we have been saying that we say like, um, Brokers come for the financial product, but then stay for the technology, right? And but I also think like if a broker comes because they have a pain point, they're like, okay, what I I need you to solve this, and that's kind of like our okay, we have to like make sure they stick around. So we close with the financial product, but then they discover they can manage the broker's files, they can manage different things, visibility, um, keep track of things, and be more productive. And that's like if they get they they get hooked. And for us, that's, that's imperative because otherwise, um, international product can can be a race to the bottom, right? You need retention, you need brokers sticking around. Uh, but our wedge into the market has definitely been um, actually with the financial product and then driving retention through um, different things, such as let's say you can manage your whole brokerage house, see all the rentals from your team uh, with Morada Uno, for instance, right? And now you want to stay there. Or the renewals after a year, you, you'll get notified and you get um, pinged and manage that too, right? So that's kind of like the, the building the SaaS. Um, so you can you can continue to, to use Morada Uno, um, but, it, but it's probably like the, the flip of acquiring through your, your software. And I think this is great because now we are going to be able to contrast that with yeah, Gonzalo, what you guys have done at Camino and you just mentioned it, right? Like you, it was very clear from the beginning that you guys wanted to build a software and find, make sure that it will solve the clients, the user's problem, but that they would be willing to pay for that. We know in emerging markets, um, it's hard to have this type of businesses being able, but also having the willingness to pay for a subscription. So Tell us more about the, the secret sauce and how you guys have been able to uh, prove mm -hmm. that wrong. So, so the first the thing is how you land you know, into mid-sized businesses in, in Brazil and make them pay. Uh, we started from, from, let's say, the end. What do we want to be? At the end, we want, we want to become the CFO suite uh, for mid-sized business in Brazil. Okay, so, so for that, what do we need to build? How, how can we enter those mid-sized businesses in Brazil? If you compare that to developed economies, or when we compare those mid-sized companies in the US versus, versus Brazil, we see that there is a lack of basic solutions that help those companies uh, handle their payables, the receivables, reconciling. So we saw that a, a breach there. We saw an opportunity on those mid-sized businesses to build a series of uh, workflows, automations, embed our uh, proprietary uh, payment rails, and generate a lot of efficiency there. So the way to start charging was by showing them that there, was, that there were large opportunities for efficiency. Because reality is that today our competitor, it's labor. Uh, basically companies, instead of hiring Camino, what they do is they just put more people on, onto the problem. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So the way to land is to show efficiency in a way that those companies are not going to fire the people. They're just going to think, okay, I can still grow 
without needing to hire more people. So then how do we expand? Reality is that with Camino, we thought about the control point. We see that automation of those workflows of payables and embedding uh, our proprietary payment rails and integrating with the rest of the bank accounts, I could have access to 100% of the financial flows and have not only possibility of knowing their cash flow, but also giving that data to the client. So with that data then, after 90 or 120 days, uh, the client using that platform, then I can start upselling uh, other mm -hmm. products. In my case, I have a bank account that they can use and make their payouts more efficient versus using an incumbent. Or they can start using my corporate card that is not only a corporate card with uh, credit, but it's also a mean of having more visibility on how you spend, lowering, let's say, the different processes that you need to have to have more control on how you spend, no? So reality is first, land through efficiency and then expand with the data that you have with the client. And this is such a great example, Gonzalo, of um, earlier we talked about product sequencing and, and how you think about building a, a well-rounded solution that yes, you have the SaaS, but then you embed a bunch of other products that go hand by hand with it. I think, uh, Santiago, talking about a multi-product strategy, you guys have, have done some testing and are uh, in the future planning to roll out some products. But I would love to hear from your point of view as well. How is that thinking process? What is the rationale to think about what is the next product that Morada Uno brokers, Morada Uno landlords and tenants will need? I think for us, the, the name of the game is being at the right moment uh, in the journey, right? So a lot has been said, for instance, around uh, mortgages, right? Could you provide, like, like in the U.S., you have a rocket mortgage and a simplified version of that. And, and actually, um, there's, there's quite a bit of players that have tried to do that at the beginning of the funnel, the beginning of the journey, like we're looking for a house. Like, Let me help you with uh, your mortgage. Um, but the, the, the reality is like the conversion is very low because the, the, the tenant is not ready to buy. Sorry, the, the buyer is not ready to buy yet. Right? So they're like exploring or looking around. But when they're like, okay, I found the house. I want to make an offer. My offer got accepted. Um, it's contingent on getting a, a mortgage. Then that's kind of like the, the right point of getting inserted. And I use this example because um, that applies for, for a, lot, a lot of things. It's like being at the right moment uh, in the journey. And, and I, I think for us, having the brokers um, tapping into Murada Uno right at the moment of closing the transaction opens up uh, those things, right? Like we're thinking about uh, rent advances for landlords uh, right now because we know we know the tenant, we under, we did the underwriting, um, they're paying well, we can like actually offer um, advancing of the rent. Um, but that's much easier to you know, add like once the rent is running, uh, to look for a landlord and say, hey, like I could do that. Like next time you have a um, lease, right? and whereas here, like they know us, we have a relationship already. We know the tenant, and it's much easier. So I think for us, it's actually like being able to like insert whatever product or service or or product you're solving uh, at the right uh, moment uh, in in the journey. Amazing. Um, this this is a great example that also I think translates back to to Camino. Gonzalo, that data competitive advantage that you guys are able to, to build because you have input from all the different bank accounts of a client. You're able to show them real-time transactional data. Tell us more about how you're thinking of using that perhaps for future uh, mm -hmm. products that you have in mind. Uh, so I imagine similarly to what happens with Morada Uno, I think uh, what we want to drive is actually building a data set that is going to help uh, financial markets see our potential client, our clients, our client base with better eyes. Today, reality is that there is a huge uh, lack of uh, proper or adequate financial products or competitive. No, if you think about, let's say, Brazil, out of ten companies that ask for a credit line, for example, uh, mm -hmm. only one get it. Five basically do not get an offer. Four reject it because it's too cumbersome or too risky. And one just accepted it, not because if it's a nice offer, it's basically because they are desperate. 
Okay. Mm. So I think it's it's a mixture of uh, I think it's a mixture of mistakes on both sides. Reality is that today financial market cannot rely on what a mid-sized business in general is doing because the the way they do things, uh, the data that is generated is not reliable or it's not standardized. That's what companies like Amino, I'm sure the uh, Morada Uno is built, are, uh, we are building. So today we are just on day one. We're just ma making sure that that layer of data is consistent and then starting to open up Camino to different solutions of the CFO and its team to make sure that the, the data is always updated and trying to find what's the next step in terms of helping those companies uh, grow. And obviously credit uh, done with a very in a very sensible way, very smart way, because it's not the same thing selling credit that collecting it, okay? I think the important mm -hmm. thing is to actually open the possibility of uh, those companies having access to more adequate financial products. Um, I can't believe time flies. And uh, I think we are going to have to start wrapping up. But this is such a rich conversation that I would like to continue. Um, and maybe just to, to close off, um, very curious, you know, um, if there are any other SaaS companies out there that you admire and why. Um, and maybe if we can close off with um, a few words, um, words of advice that you would like to share with fellow founders that are, again, in the process of, of starting their SaaS or, or building and scaling it in the region. Go ahead, Santiago. Okay. Um... The SaaS company I admire, I think, Toast. And one of the things I admire about them is um, you think, okay, like they, they're a huge SaaS company and they're, what percentage of revenue comes from, from the SaaS part? And it's actually at around 10%, 12, 10%. Um, and, and oftentimes when you're thinking about a, a SaaS platform, you want to, you, you think, well, like it's not working because only, only a small percentage uh, today comes from SaaS uh, and the majority comes from financial products. But I think it's critical to understand if the SaaS from the platform is enabling uh, that those future revenues, or it's like people are coming back or staying because of the, the SaaS offering, right? Even regardless of, um, of of the revenues coming from there. So I, I like to think about like, okay, we at Morana Uno right now, we're like hovering around uh, five, four or five percent of revenue coming from SaaS, but it's also driving driving usage and retention. So we can like look up to um, to that model. Amazing. On my side, Diana, uh, I admire many companies, obviously, but I think in Brazil, it's a company that has been able to build a new category, uh, being able to have an impact. It has been able to um, help many, many small and mid-sized companies grow. And they have been able to do that on a SaaS model and it's RD station. Really the study of RD station didn't end up being listed on, on the NASDAQ, uh, but it was also a company that was launched maybe in 2010 or so uh, and acquired by, by Totus, who is also a great study of 40, 50 years of entrepreneurship. And I think they open up the, the our mindset uh, of thinking, and that comes back to a, an advice to founders, I think if you want to build a SaaS solution, you need to be very resilient, uh, a lot of grit. Uh, go over what we said here and, and more, talk to a lot of people. And uh, you're going to have many ups and downs, but uh, if you actually know what you're building and you have a very good product, then focus on go to market. I think in, in, emerging, in emerging markets, you can have a very good product, but having a very strong go to market makes it huge difference. And RD Station was case, but there are other many more in the Latin America, smaller SaaS companies that are now having a lot of success based on not necessarily having the greatest product, but having a very clear go to market. Amazing. Well, maybe we can close this off there. I really want to thank you, Gonzalo Santiago, for your time, these valuable insights. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Diana, for the invitation. A uh, pleasure to chat again, Gonzalo. Of course. Thank you, Santiago. A pleasure. See you. Thank you. Ciao. For questions regarding today's discussion, Flourish Ventures, or any of our portfolio companies, please email us at events at floridsventures.com.
looking forward to seeing you next time.